Hey guys, welcome back. BDCKR here. We're back with Season 6, Episode 14 of our weekly P and Q and C and A and T videos. And uh, starting last week, I think, was the first time we did it, but you have a little rundown just for people who are sure. new or maybe people who have listened before but want to hear it again. We can swap it up just so it's not exactly the same. But. <laughs> I don't know anybody ever wants to hear it again, but it'll be like, you know how uh, TV shows used to have introductions yeah. and they would they would get you in the sort of the mood because it was the thing. So Yeah, this know, is this is... is like an intro, except it's not yeah. it's not good like a theme song. It's just <laughs> it's us talking. Good. It's just more of us talking. Yeah. So P is for podcast because we've got patrons on Patreon that have made it worthwhile uh, for us to give up ad revenue that lets everybody have the choice to listen to this as just audio without being tied to youtube yeah so a uh, link in the description if you're on the youtube video to if you want to listen to this in podcast form on any of the major podcasting platforms yeah cues for questions which is how this all started when we started getting questions in the comments on our youtube videos and we decided to start doing something with yeah them. This, it was half of the title when this was a q and a <laughs> yeah well, that that's spoiler alert, right? Yeah. Um, C is for comments because not everyone who says something worth talking about is asking a question. Uh, a is for answers, which we have lots of, and you know we we focus on quantity and not quality. Quantity of talking, not even quantity of answers. Yeah. <laughs> we, we answer um, some T- questions. Some, occasionally, we come to an answer to a question, and normally, when a question is asked, we we do something approximating answering it. Yes. And the last is T for talking, because sometimes we just talk, we ramble on, and now we're still doing this video in two locations, mm-hmm. and I like this as an excuse to, to, to sit and chat with you hmm. about lots of stuff. Yeah. One of them being just stuff that's happened over last week or that I learned last week that I want to share. Hmm. Okay, shoot. All right, so f- first thing is, radon is the number one cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. Now, I remember you mentioning, or I don't remember you mentioning this specific fact, but I remember you talking about radon. Is this something that you've learned this week or you're just sort of remembering? I, I've learned out? this week more in terms of the details of what it is. Because all right, So what I knew before was that radon was something that was potentially dangerous. Yeah. And so there's they sell kits at Home Depot and Lowe's. And I learned a little bit about how certain kits that are short-term aren't as good or as useful as the long-term kits because the amount of radon that you get... All right, so radon comes from natural sources. It comes from deep in the earth. It comes from building materials. Yeah. And it uh, forms a gas. And if the gas doesn't get vented, then that has a stronger effect, right? So yeah. it's always coming up, but you, if you're in the open air, it doesn't matter because it just dissipates. Mm-hmm. So why I learned more were the details about why... Um, it's important how big an impact it, it has, like that it actually was a significant cause of uh, lung cancer. Yeah. So when you're in the basement, if you spend time living in a basement apartment, it's actually higher risk. And you can do something about it. So if it turns out that, that there is high radon, uh, you can do stuff that will vent the uh, radon gas. So just venting the gas in the basement, like through a heat mm-hmm. exchanger, will actually decrease your risk of cancer. So you don't just have to abandon the basement and seal it up if the results come back that there's a lot of radon. Exactly. So, it, listen, there's there, some tests if you do something, just checking something out is not enough, right? Yeah. Like, if you if you find out there's a problem, all it does is it'll, if you can't do anything about it, it's just going to stress yeah, you out. Yeah, because you, 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 you use the radon test, right? In the I used the kit. Yeah, so, the, and it's, um, so you, we had to special order it, and you can leave it up for between 3 to 12 months, I think. Mm. And the longer you leave it, the better uh measure you get because over the year it's supposed to fluctuate with each season yeah and so that's why the short-term ones are not good because it might give you a a falsely higher falsely low reading for what you're mm-hmm. actually at risk for okay and so Which what was kind of uh, cool did you get the results back for that we did uh and it was below the 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 sort of threshold where you're supposed to do something about it but all right so the crazy thing is so i work with a lot of people who i i think are are, are well, they, I don't think they are otherwise very smart, but it doesn't seem to s- sort of register on the radar that this is anything significant. Yeah. And so I just think it's interesting, right? Because for all the the issues we make about smoking, especially mm-hmm. now that smoking is not socially acceptable, yeah. non-smokers have... Or not socially w- encouraged the same way. I think it is still socially acceptable depending oh, on... Oh, is it? The gr- well, it depends on the, um, who you're talking I, to. I, I mean, guess that's true. I, I know I guess that's true. definitely seeing a lot more international students at... Um, uh, my my campus and seeing people from a lot of different places, uh, there definitely are way more people smoking 
um, than than just smoke where I I lived before. So I think definitely depending on where you're where you're from, it is still yeah. socially acceptable. Because I think there's there's at least a little bit of inconsistency. Mm-hmm. If you're gonna make a big deal about smoking, I think it it makes sense to to make radon an issue too. That's true, but I guess when you say number one cause among non-smokers, the drop off is probably pretty significant. I'd imagine. So you know what? It's a it's like an order of magnitude thing, right? Where like drunk walking for distance traveled is more dangerous than drunk driving, but you're probably not going to make an issue of drunk walking. All right, so hold on, let me just pull this out. Um, there's some numbers here that this is the more, more the details that I learned. So the lifetime risk to a smoker exposed to radon. Mm-hmm. So if it's smoking only, the lifetime risk of getting lung cancer is 12 percent. If they smoke and have radon exposure. It jumps to 30%. Oh, wow. Okay, that is significant. And somebody, so lifetime lung cancer risk, uh, if you're exposed only to radon at low outdoor levels is 1%. Yeah. And for, so this is non-smoker, it jumps to, uh, it can jump to 5% with 800 becquerels per meter cubed. Okay, so there is actually a chance that um, if you're looking at pure smoking versus pure radon, it's le- it's less than, it's it's more than one third as likely to get cancer, which is actually right. significant. It, yeah, right. It's not. This is this is the part I learned. I mean, I knew that radon was a risk, but I, I saw some numbers about how just how important, how significant it was. Yeah, that's true. Because when you combine smoking with radon, that's the worst. But if you if you just compare pure one or pure the other, that actually is still significant numbers. Twelve versus five percent is not. Yeah, is not like uh, as big a drop off as I. Um, right. As I thought, okay, so you shared something. I'm going to share something which is totally um, unrelated just because I, I felt it um, just now, a little sting in my finger. Um, I had a very kind of sad injury, I'm going to say, just sort of uh, not not like, a- actually, I'm not like emotionally traumatized by it or anything, but it's just, um, it was just an injury that happened and I just sort of looked at myself with disappointment because... <laughs> uh, oh, that kind of sad, okay. That kind of sad, yeah, because I was... um making i was i was too lazy to make myself a proper dinner uh and didn't want to go out or do anything so i was uh just opening up a can of um chef boyardee uh lasagna (laughs) mix which was it turned out to be actually pretty good but it was just i mean it was a little bit of a sad sort of uh inherent meal it is mostly lasagna and then like an apple and um some some oh, soup. apples healthy yeah i mean <laughs> but like a pretty a pretty like sad kind of cobbled together meal anyways um and, and so i was opening it with a can opener i i went to pull the top off and i sliced my finger open not deep oh but, but just a little um cut on the edge of the metal can and so i just sort of stood there holding my um can of room temperature chef boyer de lasagna um <laughs> and contemplated the dinner that i was about to eat and it was just a little it was it was sort of a it was a sad injury to happen you know it's it's like it's like a sad paper cut it's like a paper cut but just it's got that layer of i don't know just disappointment Um, yeah uh yeah i feel bad for you no it's okay i'm fine i'm not i'm not interested in uh i wasn't i wasn't trawling for pity or anything but i just thought it was maybe more entertaining than anything else it's because it's unfortunate to happen but then i think in talking about it you take away a little bit of the sting (laughs) <laughs> yeah i make it sound like a bigger deal than it is i slice my finger open on a can but it just it just um struck me as a little <laughs> like especially embarrassing just given the context right yeah okay. so there we go uh, i think we can move on i i think i like the radon discussion better uh yeah. i think we can <laughs> <laughs> i know it's more personal i know that some people are listening for that but i think I like the radon because it's educational because it's still something that I learned too, right? Like That's in terms true. of just the magnitude of the problem. Sorry. I mean, this is also something that you learned. It's just not particularly um, useful. Yeah. <laughs> the lesson is don't eat Chef Boyardee out of a can. That's true. Um, I mean, I have some other cans of Chef Boyardee though. I got them. I got them for. Uh, I got them for free. Oh, is that the the food bank at the school? Yeah, it's not like a food bank exactly because there's a sort of like connotation of like need when you're going to a food bank. Um, but it's right. just like, so yeah, it's they, like a they, student support it's like a student like grocery thing right, yeah right, right. No, so, so i have i have a lot of chef boy idea of various kinds and i'm, I'm gonna be more careful with the and future, various ages future openings yeah yeah all right uh anyways our first question <laughs> comes from palindrome and they say multiplayer mode is no longer playable for me because of the advent of the new metal characters i would play with my elite 10 
level and i'm assuming it's level 60 but it just says level level team and would be annihilated immediately even with specific gears by maxed out metal teams like wtf those teams are so overpowered against the conventional teams yeah i mean this is what we see every time right anytime there's new content in the game that uh has a potential to be a little bit unbalancing um the matchmaker seems to struggle a little bit uh putting teams up appropriately especially since the hack teams i mean we've talked about this i think in each of our recaps the last couple weeks where the amount of valorium alloy to actually max out a team properly it's not possible yeah you wouldn't even have a single fully maxed out character with uh specials and dark power right now never mind a full team right um even just to get the specials maxed out you could probably get two specials maxed out without dark power with the passive maxed out and you you just and they're not actually dangerous like those yeah characters may be annoying but they're not and so i think and it's if we also wait a- almost impossible for them to be at elite seven for a full metal team at this point too oh yeah i mean what you're looking at i mean it's different levels of hacking right so if you hack just the currency then yeah it's possible because then you can get the nth metal right because there i mean there are programs where people pretend like they're spending money but they don't and that is its own problem. And we've talked about this before too, right? How that actually contravenes the terms of service. And I guess if you don't really care about having your account suspended, then, you know, you can do that. The problem is with that kind of stuff is not only is it specifically against the terms of service, it's really easy to see. Yeah. Like if they were had any interest in looking at it and then having the max out meta characters just puts you, um, just exposes you. Yeah. I guess but, the, the one advantage for people who are doing that is Warner Brothers probably doesn't do a lot of automatic banning for that stuff anymore. Right, right, right. But so th- this illustrates the point, and I, I want to keep on coming around to it, is that the it, it's that sort of struggle between whether this is a collecting game or a fighting game. Mm-hmm. And if it's a collecting game, then I can see the appeal of maxing them out. If it's a fighting game, though, I, I don't, because it means that what, what you're getting is... You know, when you hit the upper levels of um, we max out characters, right? Where their whatever their hidden um, threat level is, mm-hmm. it's you end up seeing a lot of the same teams over and over. And so, what you see in the fight right now with this particular team, where we're using um, old golds, where they're elite uh, seven, yeah. we're facing a variety of teams. We're not even close to the max uh, number. Ba- well, we are pretty close to the ma- number of max battle points, but we're not close to the max stats that would make us face the same teams over and over again with Astro Harness and stuff that would make fights last longer every single time. Yeah. And so is is that better, the way we play it? Because it's different, right? Like, w- once you can get over the idea of playing this as a collecting game mm-hmm. and you're willing to play it as a fighting game, I think, I, for me, it, it's got more longevity. It's more fun to play mm-hmm. long term. I agree. And um, I think maybe one thing that we could do, I don't know if you have any opinions on this because I'm not sure I know the answer to this question. Uh, what would your advice be for beating uh, maxed out metal teams if, you, if you're if you fighting them? What strategy do you think you would go with just personally? Uh, I guess there's different levels. There's the, there's the strategy of setting up your team and then the strategy of fighting when you're there. Yeah, I mean, uh, just team setup. What do you think is a good team to, to take I, on the metal set? Okay. So if, if you're facing Shazam, New 52 Shazam, you have to have a tank. I mean, we used to mm-hmm. play some teams where you didn't really need a tr- traditional tank. Like, for example, if you had an Arkham Knight team, you could play Arkham Knight Batgirl, and because she gave each of the Arkham Knight teammates an extra life, that would technically make them more tanky. Yeah, um, but not like an actual tank. But not like an actual tank, right? So it would increase the ability to absorb damage, but it wouldn't buy you the time that you need if you're facing somebody that had 21 mm-hmm. seconds of invulnerability, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the first thing is that you actually have to have a real tank and maybe you need some of the legendary gear to set it up so that it's a tank that can really eat a lot of hits without taking damage. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, um, like new 52 Superman, maybe killer croc, maybe, I guess it depends on what kind of team you're working with. That's true. And then you need to, I mean, uh, Catwoman. Uh, metal the Batman Ninja Catwoman is really sort of an interesting kind of thing because she has probably the single most spectacular kind of offensive um, passive, which is as to me is as good as Flashpoint Batman, but maybe give you give up a little bit because it doesn't make your teammates any better. Mm-hmm. 
And the answer to that has always been just knock her out first. Right? So you yeah. need somebody who's got a lot of, who can give you really good um, damage output. And so the most dangerous kind of cat woman would be one with Astral Harness where you would not only need damage output, but you almost have to have Tantu Totem because doing the specials prioritizes your hits over hers mm. and it buys you the time while the invulnerability of Astral Harness is still there. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of a general strategy. I don't know that um, anybody other than those two is particularly dangerous. Oh, maybe um, uh, Batman Ninja Nightwing is a little bit dangerous because you need to be ready to swap out when he or one of his teammates tags in and, and takes away your energy. Hmm. And the only thing that protects you, really, you can see this in the Justice League team that we've got, where as long as you're in the middle of a special, but not at the end of a special, you can sometimes keep Nightwing from, or anybody, or even like um, Regime Raven from stealing your power. Hmm. Okay, I think that is, that's it, right? Yeah, I think Go so. Ahead. I mean, and then it becomes the play, I guess. And that's it depends on how you like to play, but really is just being aware of who's coming in and who's not and just tagging the right person in. I mean, it's 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 too broad to actually talk about it, but it's kind of basic. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Our next question comes from Zach Scream. And uh, they say, or it actually might not be pronounced like that because there's a lot of accents. The the S is capitalized and the R is capitalized in S-C-R-E-E-M. Right. Um, so it's possible that this is somebody stylizing their name and it's possible that this is uh, a name that is just pronounced very differently from uh, <laughs> how I have just pronounced it. So uh, I guess let me know in the comments uh, if you if I did it wrong or if I did it right uh, and if you would like to correct us or let and by correct us I do mean me <laughs> I, I say us every time and uh, I always have to I always have to backtrack if you want to well, correct me I mean technically it's both of us, us well I you, you take on the responsibility so you're the only one you, you leave yourself vulnerable I was sort of getting away with something because That's I, true. I don't actually I mean take it on would it would be work. educating us but correcting me yeah. Uh, I think is is that so but anyways they have they have a question which is perhaps um you know in this case more important to address for the for the for everybody else listening than uh, how to pronounce their name uh, so they say I have a question I have seen Flashpoint Batman with ninety nine thousand damage and some with eighty two thousand damage and they both said they are fully augmented Elite Ten level sixty of course so is there a difference between evolving a champ to Elite Seven at level one then level it up to fifty then um and leveling the champ to 50 first then evolve it to elite 10 and um i mean first off just really quickly that's that's the end of the question i would say uh this is this is obviously uh being totally pedantic but there is a difference between evolving it to elite 7 and then leveling it up to level 50 um and leveling it up to 50 and evolving it to elite 10 the difference is uh approximately three elite levels worth of it but i know that's not that's not the <laughs> that's question, not the that question yeah that's not the question that you're actually asking and uh i i understand it don't want to be yeah i mean and the answer is pretty straightforward but maybe there's some other things that are worth discussing i mean you always end up you always end up in the same place with stats whichever path you take yeah and so that's pretty uh kind of basic no matter uh how you you get there your end point is always going to be the same so for any given elite level in any given level your stats are going to be the same um no matter what order you you did the eliting and the leveling but i think the second question that we can answer here and this isn't a question that you directly asked but why are the stats different if that's not the reason right 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 this was sort of your best guess at the reason and so yeah if that's there's a not few things the reason, there's then... i think three things right yeah. so there are support cards that are specific to batman yeah so you get the plus 10 percent for attack if what you were for the thing that you're looking at here yeah i mean it, it, at one point i think the display i can't remember now whether it's true or not the display doesn't show whether they've actually got their um when you're fighting opponents in multiplayer, doesn't show whether they've actually got the cards or not. Even mm-hmm. if they have them, it shows it look. It used to look like they didn't have anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've got that. You also have uh, alliance support cards that uh, boost stats for everybody that cost alliance credit. So whether or not somebody's purchased those will also uh, matter in the same vein. Right, and then there's augmentations for damage, and so you can increase everybody's. Uh, stats their damage or their health or whatever 
by the equivalent of 300 of what their base damage is. Yeah. So if you look at the card that's elite zero, level one with no support cards, they have a, a certain amount of damage, a certain amount of health. Each of those can be increased by the equivalent of 300 so that it will progress as you move up like it was just a higher stat. Yeah. And that's so, why a high stat guy, when you augment them, they the impact in terms of just absolute numbers is actually lower, right? Or mm-hmm. then um, somebody that's... Uh, or actually, sorry, the absolute impact I think is the same, but the percentage increase is lower because they start off so high. And 300 is such a small the, percentage of, the, say, the, Yeah, the proportional percentage yeah. increase. So yeah. if somebody yeah. starts out at 300, you double their stats by augmenting them. But if somebody starts out at uh, 1,200, right. right, you only increase their stats by 25%. Right. Um, yeah, okay. So there, I think that's that's the answer to that question. So but is there anything else worth to talk about? But see, the, the problem, in, in terms of just how useful a card is, I mean, there's two things, right? So there's the usefulness of a card versus just how powerful, and that really comes down to the sort of online, offline thing where there's yeah, the, this matchmaker is, this or not. This is very similar to what we were talking about earlier with the collecting or playing, right? Mm-hmm. Where um, a leading them and uh, leveling them up all the way is a, or leveling up happens naturally, but a leading them all the way is a collecting thing and in the same way augmenting them is also a collecting decision instead of like an inherently right. playing decision because if you're using them in online uh it doesn't really change anything except for the people that you fight and right. the, the change that that makes is i think uh we would definitely argue a negative one as long as you're not increasing battle points right um so once you're at maximum battle points augmenting people for attack actually is like pretty strictly a disadvantage i would say yeah, and my best advice actually, as far as the two two sort of streams, like we're talking promotion, which is the elite level, or just leveling up. The most important thing I think to do is actually level them up for, first, if you want to have them useful and flexible to decide what you're going to do with them later. Because if you if you promote some somebody up first and then use them a lot and you like them, you can end up leveling them up past the point where they're useful to you the same way. Yeah, past the point where they are. Um like matched with all your other characters. Right. So let's say so, you have somebody who's elite seven and now they're at level 20. You say, oh, now he's perfect. But that level 20, you can't fix in mm-hmm. time. It's going to just keep on increasing. Then you're not going to have any kind of stability for like, you can't use them long term that way. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, what, what you want to do is be able to have the ability to bring them up with elite levels because you can control exactly the rate at which that happens, but you can't control right. that for leveling. Yeah, I mean, you can't fine-tune it, right? Like, the elite level is a, is a jump, but the levels, or sorry, the elite promotion, whatever, is yeah. it, sure, are relatively big jumps, but the levels won't stay where they are. Yeah. So even though it's finer, it doesn't really help you the same way. Yeah. So there we go. Oh, you've got, you've got another little note here in between the questions that you yeah, wanted so, all right. to talk about something else that's not. So, so this was a kind of a productive week. Um, yeah. So I learned lots of little things. So there was, in, in the U.S., so I, I have to admit, I'm really, I know that Canada has its own inherent problems with its politics right now, mm-hmm. but they're not nearly as interesting. So the uh, SNC-Lavalin thing is sort of, it feels like not nearly as big a um, problem or a, I don't know, what's Deal? the word? Yeah. A spectacle? Or, you know, when it's, I don't know, the, the word escapes me now, but it's something big and bad like some sort of um uh i'm totally brain fart here but the american ones seem much more interesting because there's sort of a fundamental disconnect between just knowledge and what they're fighting about because there's a guy i think it's robert kennedy who's either a senator or a congressman or something and i read something that made me think that or I think it was him. I hope it was him because I'd, I'd hate to accuse somebody of the wrong thing, but he thinks chicken yeah. pox parties are actually a good thing. Mm. And then I read something else where somebody else was chiming in and saying, um, not only do chicken pox um, immunize you against uh, wild chicken pox infection, it immunates, immune, uh, vac- immunizes you against future chicken pox infections, but it also uh, protects you against shingles. Hmm. So do you remember? It's a Kentucky governor. Let is me it? See. Okay. Uh, who is this? Matt Bevan. Okay. So do you remember the Great Brain series by John D. Fitzgerald? I do. Yeah. That was great. 
like <laughs> I mean it's it's kind of stupid to say that I can't think of a better word right now but it was a, it's a a, a a middle age reader maybe series yeah. of books and it was um I don't even remember what the time frame was but it's like you know the late 1800s I think oh yeah it was it was like I don't, I don't remember exactly but it was like noticeably like super super old Right, and they actually had chicken pox parties in a time before they had um, vaccines. And it wasn't really just chicken pox parties, it was anything. So it was like measles, mumps, whatever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it was the idea that instead of waiting for for uh, one of those childhood infections to catch you whenever it caught you, you're controlling. Yeah. So if one kid in the neighborhood got chicken pox, you would get them all together. Yeah. Or I mean, your this family. Is, this is exactly what Matt Bevan said he did in this article. His nine kids... Uh, a friend a neighbor had it and he went and made sure every one of his kids was exposed to it and, and got chicken pox and did a total got got all of his children uh, ch- uh to have chicken pox and thinks that we should not that the government should not i say we like i'm the government um <laughs> it's about, like i'm the true. government in america You're the man. Which, is, which is especially inaccurate because i'm not even allowed to vote in america never mind be voted for but so um he suggests that the government should not be regulating vaccination yeah okay so here's the the problem i mean i guess there's different arguments that you hear for right there's that sort of libertarian kind of argument where um the government should not infringe upon our rights and i think this is one of those cases where potentially at least if you believe the science the the greater good you know, the same way you have laws for seat belts, the way you have laws yeah. for insurance when you drive, the greater good or to protect Or you have laws everybody. against assaulting people, I think is maybe a closer parallel to draw here. Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. It's any kind of stuff where, you know, the government, you know, intervenes for particular good. Yeah, on behalf of safety. Right. So, but then the argument becomes, it shifts gears from, okay, so the, we should keep the government out of it to say, well, if we give them vaccines then maybe the idea goes, all right, so shingles is supposed to be a reactivation of chickenpox virus. So you get chickenpox, yeah. it's all over your body. It The virus never actually goes away. Even though you recover from chickenpox, the virus stays in your body and it can become reactivated later when your body's immune system is weak. Mm-hmm. So the, the next argument against it, when the first one about, you know, your freedoms and stuff when that argument fails yeah because i think i i mean we should address it as far as i'm concerned because of herd immunity and just how that works um and just personal safety the government is making an executive decision to place um people's safety over people's right to be wrong about science <laughs> that's true but no but see this is why the 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 science arguments are always the most per- pernicious because so the argument is that um, so shingles is when it reactivates and your mm-hmm. body can suppress the chickenpox virus. And because the incidence of shingles is increasing, the argument is, well, it's the vaccine programs that are causing it because now you're getting less wild chickenpox virus that the older people are being exposed to to remind mm-hmm. their immune system every once in a while to keep on making antibodies so that they're less likely to have uh, a shingles outbreak. Mm-hmm. And the one of the things that's that I've seen used is that the NHS, which is the British medical system, actually has a position saying, this is why it's not a part of uh, routine vaccination. And they mm. make a case that, um, well, if you, it's potentially more dangerous for those who were, who are unvaccinated because um, they're going to be getting it when they're older because they have less of a, uh, a chance of being exposed to it. And they are, the people who have not had the vaccine are more at risk of getting shingles because they don't get the, the wild virus kind of reminders to their immune system, the little boosts. So that's, that's interesting. That is one argument, I but would it, say. And it's, it seems pretty convincing on the face because, I mean, this is the NHS, right? So it's a bunch yeah. of doctors, but also a bunch of policymakers. But I think they've got it wrong because... So the CDC has actually addressed that specific concern saying, okay, so um, yes, shingles has been increasing around the same time that the U.S. introduced uh, the chickenpox vaccine routinely mm-hmm. for kids. Mm-hmm. But the rate of shingles was increasing before the introduction of the programs. Yeah. And it, after the introduction of programs, the rate of increase did not jump. 
and data from other countries where they do not have a, a, a mass vaccination program, their rates of shingles were also increasing. Hmm. So that's that, interesting. So it could be a, a third variable that's causing sure, it. Sure. And you can come up with lots of potential things, right? Like maybe people are using um, immune suppress, suppressive drugs more often. Hmm. Um, maybe there's other kinds of illnesses that are affecting, you know, like, for example, diabetes is something that affects your immune system a little bit. Ooh, that was a mistake. So Rebirth Raven just dropped in and I did not tag out Luchador Bane fast enough and she took all my power and then knocked me out. Okay. Hmm. So anyway, sorry. Um, I digress. Uh, For anybody listening on the podcast, that's uh, I'm so, I apologize. <laughs> but it's it's like the same argument, right? With that yeah. happened with the MMR vaccine, where yeah, sure oh there was God. an no, but there was an associational uh, increase of uh, autism diagnoses yeah. with the uh, use of the MMR vaccine. And it turns out it was not related at all. Two two things can be increasing at the same time. Yeah, not causally at all. And so yeah. I think this is another one of those cases where without, you know, it's it's definitely a weaker argument without a particular scientist with a financial conflict of interest making, uh, putting forth fraudulent uh, research to try to yeah. enrich himself. So it's not nearly as strong and... But it's still the same kind of thing, right? Like without digging a little bit, if you just, you know, somebody gives you a link to the NHS saying, oh, this is why we don't vaccinate kids routinely for chicken pox, then you yeah. end up with uh, the sa- potentially the same sort of situation of yeah. missing out on one of the the few. I think there's, there's a lot of things that happen in science and medicine mm-hmm. that are really good. But, you know, you know, you make a case for antibiotics, but even more important than antibiotics was, you know, washing your hands. Mm-hmm. But to me, vaccines are one of the sort of great um, victories of modern medicine. Yeah. And it's it'd be a shame to to waste it for, I don't know, it, hmm. is stupidity too strong a word? Maybe, yeah. I, I see, I was trying to find, I was almost sure there was a joke, like an XKCD about correlation and causation where they found, like, correlations between stuff that was very obviously untrue um but i i can uh just say that i saw something uh, i don't remember what country it was in but there was a correlation uh between the number of storks that lived on um that lived on a particular house and the number of children in that house and so you can you can look at correlations like that where like you know two numbers increasing kind of it um like in the in the same conditions uh and there can be totally separate reasons uh that um that you should be drawing that are separate from the conclusion so two two numbers going up at the same time i mean the number of cell phone users is also going up the number of places that have like access to like wireless internet is also going up and you could you could make the argument and i think it would be totally wrong that you know wi-fi is causing shingles um oh that reminds you of a good joke but anyway sorry go ahead no, but anyway, so I did find this um, other XKCD about it, um, about correlation causation, which is, uh, and I'm just going to read this because I find it entertaining. Um, I, I feel like this actually is uh, probably not fair use because we're not using it transformatively at all, and it's just somebody else's content. We're just sort of referring to it. Um, but I don't think Randall Monroe is going to uh, sue After us. us. So, yeah, um, here's, here's the joke. Stolen completely uh, without comment or edit. Uh, please don't sue us. Uh, I used to think correlation implied causation then i took a statistics class now i don't and then uh somebody else sounds like the class helped well maybe Maybe. (laughs) i've seen that one i've seen that one yeah that's 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 quite good that was great you know i'm so glad we went to see when randall monroe came to do the signing for his um what uh, if yeah yeah that was quite an interesting guy yeah yeah a lot of fun all right so but all right so first thing is i remember the word i'm looking for scandal i mean how Mm -hmm. how is it how did I blank out on that? It's a really basic word, but that's... Yeah, I wasn't sure, because when you were saying, like, something bad, I'm like, catastrophe? Right? No, you know, it was like just, I like, wasn't... the innuendo associated with it somehow, you know, that it reflects poorly on it's a scandal, and it's mm-hmm. not quite entirely substantiated, because it's still got to play out, so it could turn out to be something really bad as far as mm-hmm. what it means to the government, but it feels like, at this point, that the worst that happened was that uh, Trudeau uh, was intending one thing that was a good thing, and stepped in it a little bit and screwed up what he was doing, right? Yeah. As opposed to intending to do a bad thing and then doing it. Yeah. Um, no, but all right. So you talk. You're talking about Wi-Fi and how it's pervasive and stuff. So it reminds me of a joke. Should I save it for the end? Or sh- now I'm thinking about it now. Uh, I think you should. I think you should. Because it's not really it a, a, a regular joke like with a setup and a payoff. But yeah. um, there's that meme 
Oh, where, the tree. Okay, well, I the know trees. Exactly so you know, yeah. trees. <laughs> if trees could, if every tree gave out a Wi-Fi signal, yeah, we would be planting trees everywhere. Mm-hmm. But trees, all they do is give oxygen, and the joke is, you know, goddamn trees, like. <laughs> Yeah, that, see, that's always been very entertaining to you, and it was slightly entertaining to me the first time, and it has not stuck with me at all, so, but, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, uh, like, I- I'm bemused whenever you say it, more than I am, like, directly yeah. entertained by the joke. Sorry. Because <laughs> I'm just like, it's, yeah, that is It's a that dad, is it's true. dad humor, it's a dad joke. It's... Uh, should we get back to questions <laughs> you think is dad just uh synonymous for mediocre i think dad is synonymous with um like a more i don't know a different kind of definitely not hip kind of sensibility like a grown oh, no, kind i of... was what i was doing is i was trying to tell you that the joke is mediocre <laughs> <laughs> i was sorry i guess the you're too subtle i was i wasn't quite sarcastic enough i think yeah but maybe that's okay I, I can live with that. <laughs> That's not awful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll take that. Okay, our next question comes from Lisa Peacock, and they say, uh, I loved those books, and they made a TV show based on the books that's very good, and that's, uh, I think, referencing Anna Green Gables. Right, I asked her, and she said yes, that it was yeah. about Anna Green Gables. And what's kind of cool, all right, so Anna Green Gables, written by Lucy Maud Montgomery, she wrote a bunch of books. She's Canadian, Canadian mm. content. Which and, makes sense. Yes. Because it said in PEI. It was. And she wrote a bunch of other books, too. So one of the things, it's like the great brain stuff with John D. Fitzgerald, yeah. where I end up reading stuff that wasn't even the series, like um, uh, Papa Married a Mormon. Oh, uh, Papa Married a Mormon was quite good. That was a little more autobiographical, wasn't it? it? It seemed like that, for sure. And it was definitely more adult. Yeah. Um. So, you know, it's like the great brain series. So when I tracked down as much of what the author wrote as I could. And so I even read uh, a biography at one point. But the key was, I mean, what's... Have you seen Russian Doll yet? I have not okay. seen Russian Doll so yet. Okay, so Emily of New Moon is kind of prominent. Like, not necessarily the... Well, sort of the story is prominent as, as, a, as a minor plot point in the series. And it's cool because I remember reading that too. It was one of those things that, you know, when you're digging around... And what I, it's, it's almost a shame that I don't have enough time to read as much because there's so many good books now. It's like the same yeah. issue with content, whether it's on TV mm-hmm. that, or, or um, online or whatever, where there's just mm-hmm. too much content, not enough time. And um, I, I mean, I've got a huge stack of books that I don't want to mm-hmm. read. And I, I sort of, I feel nostalgic about the time when I could just, you know, it's sort of like this, getting into the weeds a little bit and just reading stuff, yeah. some of the stuff that wasn't maybe nearly as popular, but had something different to say. Because I remember, I don't remember exactly what was happening at Emily New Moon, but it was w- way darker to me. Yeah. That's the impression I was left with in Anne Green Gables. And I, Interesting. I felt more of a kinship because in, in some ways, Anne Green Gables starts where, I mean, it's a great book. I, m- I remember watching the same, maybe the same TV show that Lisa Peacock watched because it was Megan Follows uh, as Anne Green Gables. Uh, Colin Dewhurst, and I know there's a new series, but to me, Megan Falls will always be Anne of Evils, partly because I was of the age when I first watched it, yeah. but physically, she really carried off playing a 12-year-old and uh, a woman, like, believably, in a yeah. rel- relatively short wow. period of time from, for filming it, right, from the beginning of the series to, like, the second miniseries, yeah. and back then, n- n- well, I guess VCRs were available, but we didn't have one. And so the only time I could watch it was when it was on TV. Mm-hmm. So it, I don't know if you've got because your your whole content consumption is so different. Yeah, my content consumption consumption is basically Netflix and YouTube. So it's on demand. Everything is on demand. Yeah, yeah I I watch. Well, I mean, I'm at university. I don't have cable or a TV. I only have my laptop and my phone. Um, I don't, you know, have. I don't even have access to non on demand content if I wanted it and if I did have access i probably wouldn't particularly care about it so i mean just to, and, and i'm i want to point this out to say that i'm not t- making a dig at anything it was because you know hey good hardy did the soundtrack i even got the soundtrack to it um i watched it as much as i could i got a friend to tape it for me to, so i'd have it on tape even after yeah. before i had a vcr so that when i got a vcr i could watch it when i wanted to wow yeah um but 
so so I, I I loved it. I thought it was great because you know in, in a lot of ways, and I won't really get into it, but I could. I like Anne is the kind of character you can identify with. I think a mm-hmm. lot of people can, but yeah. it, it's very much a positive kind of book because the her damage and all the stuff that happened to her happened very early and almost in the book at least it was off screen and in the tv show that kevin, kevin sullivan did with uh, megan falls and uh, mm-hmm. colin dewhurst as marilla cuthbert it happened very early on and it was i guess it was an artistic choice and they actually put a little bit of it there but it yeah. was a lot of it was very positive and the, the kind of um i don't know difficulties and conflicts that she had were I don't want to say every day because she, you know she she was still an orphan and she was being kept by you know um, the Cuthberts. Yeah. But the em, Emily of New Moon and I haven't read this for ages, but she was it the story was so much darker. Like it felt like there's just so much more bad stuff going on, hmm. and it it just it just reached me a, a, a little bit more in some ways. And yeah. they made a show about it later, but it, uh, by that time, I think I was old enough that it didn't. When I when I saw it on TV, it wasn't. It didn't have the same impact on me. Mm. Here's something not super related, but just related to reading. Uh, I have a recommendation. It's the most recent book I've read. Uh, I also don't have a ton of time to read right now. I I got through it much slower than I f- feel like I would have at a different time in my life. But um, Song of Achilles was a quite good novel. Oh, um, I saw you reading that the other day. Yeah, it was it was uh, quite enjoyable. It's like a romance, uh, and it's also like a historical like retelling of the the story of Achilles um, through the lens of uh, his companion Patroclus, and so it's uh, it's quite good. I forget what it's a uh, retelling of. Is it? Uh, I think Homer, uh, the Iliad. It. I, well, isn't the Iliad? Well, right, no, no, the Odyssey is about um, Odysseus. Odysseus, yeah. So the Iliad was about the Trojan War. Uh, yeah. So then this is also about the Trojan War. Okay. And so maybe a little um, bit of background to it. Achilles was the guy who um, was vulnerable in his tendon because uh, he was dunked in in the you know basically the the warrior equivalent of never wet only never die. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, that one part where they were holding on to it. It's like when they mold plastics and there's that mm-hmm. little bit of thing sticking out <laughs> because that's what it yeah. was attached to when they were dunking mm-hmm. or, or cutting on the mold or pouring it. So mm-hmm. that was the one spot. And then was it Paris that shot him in the Achilles tendon with the arrow? Yeah. That was it. Uh, Something Somebody that, did. I I believe it was Paris. How do you... Uh, uh, yeah. So there's one spot. It's like getting Smaug in his one place where he's got the scale missing. Well, I mean, that's actually one of the... the there's a lot more kind of mythos about Achilles, and that the the Achilles tendon part was actually part that wasn't kept in the uh, story, just because uh, I saw the the author's justification. I was I think it was like in the little section at the back of the book where there's sometimes a Q and A, right? And she was like, um, she d- wasn't you know didn't address every part of the myth because there's obviously some parts that are more or less fantastical, and so she, there was there's moments there's still like gods and um like you know like as extant forces and he is still like the son of like i don't know if she's a god she's like a river sprite or something like i forget what the the exact a term naiad is. a naiad maybe dryad i'm not they I'm had not a lot of ads sure. um but so there, there obviously still is that like fantastical element to it but um she just said for the purposes of the story it didn't make a lot of sense for him to just be like randomly like hit in the uh, like ankle right basically right um like that didn't seem like a realistic sort of uh beat in the narrative so that is, is one thing that she actually didn't specifically keep but it's a very compelling story uh i i quite enjoyed my time with it uh it's it's um interesting it's a it's a like good love story it's it's pacing is cool it's uh it does it does a lot of stuff sort of really really interesting see that that's a good point all right so some of the other authors because we've talked about this before tim powers because this fits into the Mm -hmm. whole what tim powers does with his alternate history stuff yeah where you take or even just when uh an author revisits um a story Mm. and finds a different story in the in the interstices yeah, because yeah, that's exactly what's happened here. Right, and they create a whole new story out of it that's um, 
and if the story is good, that's one thing. But if it, they can do it in a way that somehow fits within the constraints of something else, and it, it just somehow seems cooler, even if it's not inherent in the story. Like, all right, so mm. remember who's the guy, Escher, who does those pictures, where there's the picture is kind of cool, but there's a whole bunch of interlocking things that happen. Yeah. Like to me, yeah, that makes like it the impossible, like worlds. Yeah. The the geographies that don't make sense, like the the interlocking shapes. Right, and where they they sort of blend from one to the other, the, the birds mm-hmm. coming across the sky, yeah. or the horsemen, like it it just makes it that much cooler. Like when it's well yeah. executed and it has that little extra element of man, how did they do that trick? Yeah, it it it's it's done quite well because it really I think captures, um, in some ways the sort of um and i i only have uh i I couldn't tell you this for sure obviously because i didn't live in the time but it captures the sense of sort of like carelessness or not carelessness but um like acceptance um and expectation of violence that came with like the roman empire and like fighting wars and like the um like all that like so there's a lot of um I think obviously that this is at least in part like extrapolation by the author too, but I'm sure it has much more of a historical backing, but just the way that people like, you know, like wax sort of poetic about combat and fighting. Yeah. Um, from that time, when you look at different writings, it really captured that sort of same, um, that sensibility, sensibility without actually borrowing like the words. Right. So it right. was, it was written very modern, very like easy to read. Right. But it captured a lot of the same sensibility that I, um, that I, I have an association with for those sort of like older texts when they're describing like right. these events, See, here, which is quite good. So that's, to me, that's one of the marks of really good writing where even if it's something that you're not familiar with, and you really see this in science fiction and fantasy, right? Where the setting mm-hmm. is completely imagined, where you, yeah. it can't be real anyways, but there's that sense of authenticity. And I'm not sure how they do it every time, but there's something that they do that makes it believable and feel lived in. Even if it's yeah. not authentic, because you can't know. Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, you, you're totally right. I think it's I, I think she does a really good job, and I think in the Q and A she also mentioned that of like rooting the story in fundamentally like the characters mm. and who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think I think it definitely did a really good job of that. And it was just it was just a good it was just quite a good book overall. Uh, I I really enjoyed my time with it. Um, and I would I would recommend it. It's it was good enough that it made me look up what her other stuff was. And she also did uh, a retelling of the Odyssey from a non-standard perspective um, called Kirke, uh, C-I-R-C-E, which I am You've got the book, right? The the Achilles book. So I want to read that next time you're back. Leave it. Are you done with it? I am done with it. I've currently lent it to uh, a friend. So do I have to get next in line? I think you do actually have to... Yeah, is there a long line? line? So this is like a library waiting list? Yeah, I might be able to get it to you, though. It, it, it is quite good. Okay. I will I will definitely make sure that you do end up at least having the opportunity to read it. Okay. I will put the book in your hands at some point. All right, very cool. Um, mm-hmm. Now, we've actually... Normally, we're really tight for time, and we're rushing through at the end. Do we have time for one more thing that I learned this week? Sure, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is cool. So um, I learned a few things about the um, the space program. So okay. apparently, and I, I'm gonna get a lot of details wrong because this is this is me with if the details don't matter to me, a lot of times I'll just sort of gloss over and it'll be Make like a big up. blurry picture. Yeah, but the idea was that um, NASA was doing some sort of uh, promoting some sort of big uh, spacewalk thing at the space station yeah. where some of their uh, lady astronauts would get to walk outside the space station, and they made a big announcement about it. And it turns out they had to. Um, revoke that announcement because they did not have enough spacesuits. Oh. Which is funny because, all right, so not only has, did they announce it well ahead of time, but the number of spacesuits, to lose track of the number of spacesuits that they had is, <laughs> yeah, you're right, is ridiculous because, all right, That's... so they've only had 40 spacesuits since the program started. Um, they are 40 years old right now. Or, sorry, not, actually, it was 40 years old. They only ever had. Um, 18 spacesuits. Sorry, I got the numbers mixed up. They only ever had 18 spacesuits. There are 11 that are still uh, extant right now. And so yeah. some of the funny... Th- is it extant or is it extant? I don't know. A sextant? Sextant? I don't know. You know, no, this is the problem. This one. is the problem where I'm better read than I'm... Um, be- I'm better read than socialized. 
So I've seen the words, but I never hear anybody speak them. So, okay, I'm gonna look it up while you continue okay. the story. So, the so the the NASA had a program where they had uh, small, medium, large, extra large stuff like that, and because of the cost of maintaining them, so they were modular, so you could take parts and stick them together, and because they were modular. Um, you could adjust them for different size people, but because of the expense of maintaining them, because they were only meant to be in continuous use for, I think, either six years or a certain number of walks, mm -hmm. then they were supposed to refurbish them down on land, but they, a lot of them never did. So that's why they're down to 11 spacesuits. And to save costs, they got rid of the extra large and the small. But then because yeah. they had enough, they're mainly men astronauts, they, kept, they brought the extra large back because they needed them. And so now that they have women there, they don't have any the right size for them. Yeah. And what's interesting is that the Russians took a different approach. So they have the so the NASA ones are called EMUs, and I can't remember what they stand for. Um, but the Russians have one called the Orlan, O R L A N. And instead of making them modular, they just made them, I guess, one size fits all. Because one thing I read, I found a listing for somebody trying to sell one. And they said, oh, yeah, it, you know, it fits people from, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> That's so weird. What do you mean? You found a, I found a listing. listing. Was no, because I was trying it. to find a listing. Because I saw a Twitter discussion. And somebody was yeah. saying, well, part of the problem was, oh, so uh, Mary Robinette Kowal, who wrote this really great series about um, uh, lady astronauts. It started off with, uh, I think, yeah. calculating uh, the stars. But anyway, so she'd done a lot of research on this. She's saying, What's, she was the one that's commenting and brought this, this, so this is how I heard about it just today, actually. And she was saying that um, they, unfortunately, they couldn't do anything. And somebody chimed in and says, well, you know, there's the Orlon yeah. and uh, it's, they're on the space station. They could just share them or borrow them or something. And then somebody says, well, you know, the instructions are all in Russian. And maybe, maybe you don't want to be using uh, critical equipment the first time when if you make a in mistake, Russia. you will die. Yeah, that's right? fair. And then the guy comes back and says, yeah, but, you know, they already know Russian. They um, they actually do. Yes. Oh, they yeah, they do. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's, uh, you know, these are meant to fit a whole bunch of different size people and stuff. And yeah. then they were saying that uh, the response was, yeah, but they actually fit a very specific narrow range of people. He says, that's not true. They fit up to 190 centimeters. And I thought, wow, that's really weird because, you know. I think the upper limit of what you need to size it is probably not what you need where, where you need the wiggle room for for uh, women, right? Because the average yeah, height of it, women is is less, it, lower. It's, I mean, it's interesting too that um somebody is even trying to offer their opinion in this thread because I feel like the astronauts and NASA and the cosmonauts would probably know better. Well, right? It feels like they would have probably thought about that and maybe considered um the thing that some random dude online. Well, is, okay, uh, so you assume it's a dude. It was. Oh, you're right. It was. Okay, <laughs> Spoiler well, I mean, alert. It was. Um, yeah. So. It, oh, and I looked it up. It is extant, it looks like. It is? Okay. I, I will know better now. I don't think it's extant. Extant. I do not believe, but I'm not 100% I, I'm thinking extant. like Adam Ant, yeah. right? Goody two-shoes. Yeah. Don't drink, don't smoke. What you really do? Adam Ant. Um, because I know definitely the vowel, um, depending on whether you pronounce it quick or slow, there can be a vowel reduction to a schwa. So that's like extant. Um, so... It sounds, v yeah, it, it's definitely extant is like and I, a correct pronunciation. I don't think extant. I will is. remember none of this, and I will just remember that the way I was pronouncing it was wrong, and then I will have trouble the next time remembering which way I pronounced it right. <laughs> you know, do you ever, ever does that ever happen to you? Not as, <laughs> not pr particularly frequently, but it has happened to me in the past. Or you yes. think, okay, I know that the way I was pronouncing it was wrong at the start, so I need to switch it. But which was the way I used to be pronouncing it? Yeah, scythe. Scythe, yes, yes, scythe. Um, so as it turns out, <laughs> as it turns out, this <laughs> what this podcast has had a remarkable amount of uh, pronunciation, yes, uh, <laughs> instruction contained within it. Okay, so now I'm just getting tight. This is the last fight. I actually do need to to get to the point. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, yeah. So then you know uh, it's interesting because by cutting it off at 165 centimeters, I never would have realized the. Uh, based on the CDC numbers, that the average height of women was actually less than 165 centimeters. 
165 centimeters is actually the 67th percentile of uh, the height of women in, I don't know, like 2015 or something, 20, something in the yeah. 20, after 2010. Hmm. So that's, you know, I, I would have thought it was higher, but I, I, I have nothing to base it on. But it means that what that, those cosmonaut suits, those Orlan suits would do is exclude um, 67% of uh, the female population. So 67% of uh, ast- female astronauts, if they're about the same height as the mm-hmm. average American woman, would not be able to use those suits. Yeah, and I guess at that point it's a question of did they do it just because they're, they're, they had no expectation of other people uh, at that height and weren't working with anybody so that they didn't need to, or whether that was sort of more of a insidious sort of well, uh, decision, even if made sort of unintentional. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a decision, right? But the, it's funny yeah. that the 165 to 190 centimeters basically uh, gets you 90% of the bell curve of the distribution of men's heights in the U.S. Hmm. So there yeah, you go. So there you go. Yeah. So that's something interesting. Yeah, and, and now we, I'm sorry for monopolizing this discussion, but I, it just lots of stuff happened this week. That's okay. Uh, no problem. We need to thank our Patreon patrons now on Patreon. We don't need to thank our Patreons. <laughs> um, w- <laughs> you can support us on Patreon if you want to. Go to patreon.com slash bdckr. But uh, much more importantly, a huge, huge thank you to Console Peasant and Eddie G, who are supporting us at the highest tier, Last Word, iProfit, who is supporting us at the Your Message Here tier, and Sean Farrell and Daniel Simonson, who are supporting us on the credited level, not to mention Laszlo Drajadas and Chris Wolf supporting us on the Gratitude tier. So thank you guys all so much. Your support really is important to us, and not just your support, everybody who is currently watching this video, thank you guys all so much too, especially if you got all the way through 56 minutes. Our videos have just consistently been getting and then staying longer, so to anybody who actually is watching through the entire thing, that is genuinely impressive, or listening if it's in the podcast format, Um, and if you want to go ahead and leave a comment in the description to get recognized for your efforts uh it would be it would be cool to see who's actually making it all the way through uh but yeah so thank you guys all so much we will see you next time komoda